face The vision of your heartfelt work embraced The power of the rhino leads your way On a path to save them, help them stay And everything you taught will live on in Minds of countless champions of your dream. The leadership in the wilderness that we see. The wilderness is the leadership we see. When Gary Player, the famous golfer and brother of Dr. Ian Player, announced that Ian, pioneer of the Doozy Canoe Marathon, had finally rowed his canoe to the other side, it was a moment when many around the world paused to acknowledge the passing of a great conservationist. A man who was instrumental in saving the southern white rhino from the brink of extinction by pushing for the transport of surplus stock to other areas. In the 1960s, we, uh, when I say we, the Natal Parks Board had to make a decision as to what the policy was going to be. And the first thing was decided that, the, that Southern Africa would be restocked, starting with the Natal Parks, and then the whole of Southern, Southern Africa. And then after that, we would start to sell them uh, to approved zoos. And one of my jobs in the 1970s was to go across to Britain and America and sell them at 20 at a time to the really big parks like Whipsnade and San Diego. Now those are breeding stocks in another part of the world. So if anything really happened, you could still come back and restock. So it was a very important, in fact, a vital decision to make. Ian also dedicated himself to fighting for the protection of threatened wilderness areas. Through his work and as the founder of the Wilderness Leadership School, he gained international recognition and at home, he became the environmental conscience of the nation. As an investigative TV journalist, I had the opportunity to work closely with Ian on his Save the Lakes and Lucia campaign and covered many stories and places where he had worked during his years with the Natal Parks Board, one of which was in Dumo, where rampant poaching and land invasion was threatening its very survival. Poachers like these that we filmed running through crocodile-infested water became a regular feature in the reserve. The devastation to this wetland site, which the government had signed an international treaty to protect, drew strong reaction from Ian. The biodiversity in the sand forest and the fig forest and in, in Ndumo Game Reserve, I mean, you're walking into a paradise. You're walking into a cathedral. You're walking into a sacred place. And you have to be very inhuman not to be touched by it. But without soul, you haven't got a nation. Ian had an uncanny ability to win the media over to assist in his ongoing conservation battles. Without the media, we would never, ever have won the battles that we had to fight. Uh, up until the time that television came, which was in the early 70s, um, we had to rely on newspapers and magazines. Uh, when television came, it was so powerful in making people understand the issues that were at stake. And I think particularly of the, uh, the campaign for St. Lucia, when we were fighting to stop the dune mining on the eastern shores of Lake St. Lucia, 
Every time the television showed a picture of those huge dredges cutting into these beautiful forests, it was the death knell of the mining. It was at times like this that I came to know a man who had a deep spiritual connection with wilderness areas, which drove him to protect with an intense passion their integrity. He said that this connection, which he first experienced as a young man, was life-changing. All I could say is that it saved me, it saved my life. And that is why I have devoted my life to it. I mean, I was completely lost. I left school before I'd even taken JC. And I went into the army at the age of 17, came out at the age of 19, no education. Eventually I had to work on the mines, 6,000 feet down below, and then going up to what was then Rhodesia. So I was a completely lost soul. And then when I started working with the Natal Parks Board and worked in these wonderful places like Mfulosi, Tlutlui, Nkuzi and Dumo in particular, I began to realize that, you know, there was, that life was important and that, and that it was very important that these places were made available so that other people could, could save themselves. So it's not just a case of sitting in a motor car and gawking at animals as you drive past. It's the sitting on that mountain and saying and listening to that biblical phrase out of the Psalms, be still and know that I am God, that you are now part of the universe, not separate, part, and everything is sacred. Got to be looked after, got to be protected. That's why I believe the wilderness experience is so important, because that reconnects us with the natural world. And I felt it was wrong that only those of us who were game rangers should have that experience. We had to share it. We had to make it possible for other people. Out of this conviction grew the vision of creating a wilderness trail in Infolosi Game Reserve, a trail that has now become an integral part of the Wilderness Leadership School. The wilderness is not an easy journey because you are, in fact, not only doing an outward journey, not only walking outwardly, you are also walking inwardly. You are in the process of confronting yourself. And not only is there the walking, but there's the sleeping on this red earth of Africa, this very ancient continent for which we all evolved. Africa is the landscape of the human soul. This is from where we all came. And uh, I've had proof of it many times of people who come after the first few days of being terrified out of their wits by the rhino, the lion, and the elephant. They sit there around the fire and they suddenly say, you know, I feel at home here. So you are at home. This is your home. This was your original home. The wilderness experience is really of critical importance to the modern world. It's when you walk with those big mammals in Africa and hear the great variety of birds, it awakens something inside of your soul. And that's why I say I call it the landscape of the human soul. You reconnect with all your senses and it personally it felt like my senses were almost heightened. I noticed more, I could feel more, see more, uh, then you also understand a lot more about yourself. I felt the impact that nature is very powerful and it deserves respect and um, I also felt a bit more connected to it. I believe it's kind of like going back to the beginning because in general this is where humanity was before getting water from a river, cooking food on a fire. This is where we originally were. And the modern world is just about making life easier and more comfortable. 
what people don't really realize is that they're putting themselves in a cage and everyone wants to be free but in reality this is true freedom to be out in the wilderness i find god in nature and that that solitude it just it just gave me time to think like and, and reflect on my spiritual faith and just listen to the sounds of the bush and, and just think how much I love it. The wilderness experience, of course, is a religious experience. One has to understand that. Uh, and it's epitomized in the Christian world, in Christ's journey into the wilderness. But then, of course, the same thing happened with Muhammad and many of the other thousands of prophets that went out into the, went out into the desert. But what was happening was that they were getting into contact with that very primordial part of themselves. So in the modern context, a modern man has the opportunity of going into the wilderness to experience exactly the same sort of thing that the prophets experienced. Hand in glove with the religious experience that the wilderness offers is knowing the importance of respecting its spiritual integrity Something Ian learned from a person who had an intuitive response to the natural world and who had a great impact on his life. Indeed. He never cut a tree, never cut a branch, never picked a piece of grass. And he didn't touch a flower without greeting the spirit. There was the connection, connection between him and the earth. I mean, more than once, when we were sleeping out in the felt, he would wake up and say, there is a leopard going by. Now, a leopard is a cat. <laughs> that animal had come into his consciousness. He had to be very patient with me. I mean, because I was an impatient young man. So he sat me down and gave me the lecture of my life about the importance of shonipa, of respect. And after that lecture, as I got up to walk away, I remembered the words of Rudyard Kipling. You're a better man than I am, Gangadin. There he is there. I greet him every morning and I greet him every evening. I thank him every morning. I thank him every evening. The other man who had a great influence on his life was Lawrence van der Post. Somebody sent me van der Post's book, Venture to the Interior. And up to that point, I had gained a lot of knowledge, but I always felt there was something missing. I just couldn't put my finger on. And then this book arrived. I read that book from cover to cover that night. And then I knew what had been missing. Von a Post was able to graphically inculcate an understanding about the spirit of Africa. I had missed the spirit. I'd seen the outward. I had, for, had not seen the spirit. Von Apost did that for me. And he did it again with his book, C.G. Jung and the Story of Our Time, when he got me into C.G. Jung. And from that into dreams, the whole life-changing experience. Dreams became a window into the subconscious mind for Ian and he started recording and taking seriously the messages that were coming through to him. I became so entranced with nature that I was pushing Christianity away. I was becoming, well, on the road to becoming a pantheist. And it was, it was torturing me, causing me an enormous amount of grief. And then came the dream on a trail, one night. And I dreamt that I was walking and had gone through a glade. And at the end of the glade, there was an old Norman church. And growing next to the church was a huge gum tree. And I walked up to the church, up to the portico. And I looked at the tree and I looked at the church and I said aloud in the dream, if the church falls down, the tree will fall down. If the tree falls down, the church will fall down. Now, when I woke up, unlike 90% of dreams, maybe even more, 
I immediately understood what that dream was saying. That was the healing dream. The dream was telling me, the unconscious was telling me that the wilderness, which was represented for me at that particular time by the gum tree because I'd just been to Australia, and Australia has got the last of the great wildernesses of this world, and the church, the Christian church, they were together. But they weren't separated. And if you try to pull them apart, they both fall down. That was the healing dream of enormous significance to me. Another dream which had tremendous significance for Ian and hopefully will carry a message to the rest of the world came at the end of his life, but only this time from another source, renowned sculptor Andries Boerter. I was walking in an open area and I, I came to a sort of a hill and I looked up towards the top of the hill and there was like a stone acropolis at the top of the hill, which I was drawn towards. So I walked up the hill and there were these massive rocks and I was, I estimated six to eight meters massive rocks. There was a small space in between the rocks and I slipped, slithered in between the rocks and I came into an open area which was like an enclosed area. And in the middle of this enclosure there was this massive rhino out of stone that was frozen in a moment but bursting out from the actual earth itself. And the stones were kind of like moving away from it. Whoa. It was such a powerful dream. And I know that it must have been influenced because, you know, I'm, I'm working on the stone elephants in the city. So I immediately I woke up because the dream was so vivid. And to my surprise, which doesn't happen that often, I fell asleep quite soon after that. And I dreamt exactly the same dream again. It was twice. That's what made it so significant. Virtually like a rerun. Walking up through the rocks, experiencing this rhino. I hadn't even got to the point of really understanding what it really means. And I can certainly speculate what it means, but I knew immediately on the second time of waking up that I needed to tell Ian about this dream. So I kind of hung around till about 6.30 and then I phoned him. <clears throat> and I said, Ian, it's been a while since we've spoken. And I've had this incredible dream that I've really felt very strongly I needed to tell you about. Can I come up and see you? He said immediately, of course, come up, come up today. I found Ian in the lounge next to the fire where he always was. I told him about the dream. Ian said to me, good God, he said, it's a very portentous dream and it means so much. Within days of this encounter, Ian had a stroke and passed away a few days later. Was it purely coincidental that Andres's powerful dream happened when it did? The imagery will talk to many people in different ways. But if we are to look back on Ian's long struggle to draw attention to the rhino's plight, perhaps we can see it as a good omen that despite the seemingly strong odds holding back its survival, it will break through in the end because there are too many of us who are not ready to say goodbye yet. In an interview I did with Ian shortly before his death, he expressed his intense sadness at the demise of this prehistoric animal, as he so often called it. It is for me one of the most distressing times of my life. I don't think I've ever been as distressed as I have been over this murderous assault, this barbaric cruelty uh, to an innocent animal. And um, I have reached um, some pretty serious depths of depression. We are facing a problem 
that affects the world. And the world has got to take note. It's not only, not only us in Africa or in Asia where there are a few remaining rhino in Java and in India, but the whole world has got to take note. The rhino is the is the indicator of what we are facing as human beings. If pictures cry for help we cannot hear A bleeding, beating heart fall on deaf ears Yours are the lessons we recall Your wisdom that goes on for one and all Save them, help them stay. 